Well, thanks um, very much to all the speakers. Um, now over to you. I apologize that we haven't left more time for questions, but I hope we've sort of simulated something. What I propose to do is take a round of questions, and then we'll see after that if we have any time remaining. Uh, Ernest. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed all three presentations very, very much. I do indeed agree with uh, a lot of the stylized facts that Tony Venables gave us. And I share some of the views uh, about uh, Addis Ababa and the way it's uh, shaping up. Uh, what I find uh, a bit of tension with uh, in relation to uh, Tony's presentation, but basically the, the uh, challenges for African cities have been identified for many, many, many years. Uh, the African city is probably one of the most studied uh, aspects of African development uh, you find in almost every African university. What I'm not sure of is how those studies filter through into what you are bringing out. Indeed, over the years, the assumption has been that uh, to try and do the kind of uh, functional change that you propose uh, in your work here, will be too costly for the Afri average African government. And so the focus should be on uh, keeping away the migrants by developing smaller cities, uh, by developing what they call the intermediate cities. So you don't have that large urban sprawl that uh, will be difficult to deal with. I don't see how that has been done in Africa. I don't see how it can be done in the future, largely because of the cost issue. There are many other variables to consider in terms of how you can transform the every African city. How do you do that in isolation from uh, the, uh, the, the bigger question about what you do with the African economy? How do you deal with urbanization if you're not going to discuss industrialization? So, so these are things that for me are interlinked and have to be dealt with uh, in a much more comprehensive manner. So yes, the African city problem is there, but can you deal with it without discussing or dealing with the question of how do you industrialize Africa? Great, thanks. Um, could I ask just so we're so short of time, if question can be very short, and then we'll have more time for the panel. Yeah. Um, there's two questions for Sana and Franklin uh, in particular. So, so I'm very take, interested so in the- The microphone, just so we get- I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, in the migration, is it switched on? In the migration aspect of your of your um, program, um, you you stressed the looking at the migrants coming in and how they handle that transition inwards. Another part of that dynamic is who's leaving as well, isn't it? The, it probably the brightest, best entrepreneurs, younger men, um, may be leaving to go to other countries in Africa and, and trying to get the connection between the, the coming in and out. Um, and the second is a quick question on when you were talking about the, the impact of, of welfare and particularly grants, um, it would be very interesting to look there and see if uh, of, of the impact of that on enabling, on, on enabling jobs, job search, which is a pattern that I'm familiar with in South Africa, where it's not, it's wrong, it's not right to put the welfare on just the consumption side, but actually the grants not only getting kids to school, but, but also enabling job search. And then just finally to say that I think both Simon and your and Tony Venables um, inputs, th there was the strong notion of you going, people going to look for where jobs are and much less emphasis on people creating their own jobs, people making their own work, which is going to be the reality for the majority of people, I would imagine. Thank you. Thanks. Could I ask uh, people not only to be brief, but also to identify themselves at the beginning? <laughs> Francie Land from the WeGo Network. And I'm Marty Chen from the WeGo Network and Harvard University. And um, I just want to say the context that we know, uh, the WeGo Network, we've done studies in 10 cities, is urbanization without industrialization and urbanization with a very large informal economy. And our mantra is, yes, create jobs, but it isn't happening. And please preserve livelihoods. And to preserve livelihoods, we need to look at public space, not just private land. And the allocation of public space and for livelihoods as well as for leisure or for uh, formal commerce. 
And we need to realize that slums, those settlements that we want to move to the periphery of the cities, are not just places of residence. They're places of enterprise. They are clusters of enterprises. And when you move them to the periphery, they begin to operate at a loss. And we have to really think that whole plan of densification and transport to encourage the livelihoods of people. So I think there's a, a much uh, larger agenda than just creating jobs, but trying to preserve livelihoods and realizing that center and periphery public land access are very critical to informal livelihoods. Thanks. Uh, I think we'll just take one round of questions and then give the panelists a chance to all close. I'll take a couple more questions first. Never mind. Um, Rawa Harati from World Bank. It's on. Okay. Um, so my question is about, uh, it's a comment actually about the upgrading or uh, realoc relocation uh, of, um, of slums, of people living in slums. Uh, so what I found missing the perspective of uh, resilience uh, in terms of uh, the poorest people who are coming to, who are migrating from rural to urban areas and they can't afford living somewhere else in, in these slums, they're at high risk uh, natural, for natural hazard and in flood areas, some, some, some of these cities, and also because of the unsanitary way they're living and the exposure uh, they have. So I think this is very important to take into account when deciding between reallocation uh, of people and or uh, upgrading of the slums themselves. And then the other thing following on the migration uh, question is we can see in, uh, for instance, in uh, the last years in Madagascar, a lot of people following the political crisis and these uh, resilience, people migrating back from urban to rural areas. So uh, if you have any comments on that, thanks. OK, just two more, but ask you to be very quick, please. Yes, uh, I'm Sunil Bandu from University of Mauritius. Now, I, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the presentation, but when you look at the, the finance, the capital budgets, what will involve, they seem astronomical, huge. And you wonder whether governments on their own will be able to, to, to get the finance to do all this. So my point is, in your, in your research, I'm sure, in your projects and so on, so where these concepts of BOT, Bill Operate and Transfer, and PPP come in? Because I think without these, it will be almost impossible for governments on their own to provide all the finance to, to, to get to the stage you need to get in the next 30 years. So I think BOT and PPP will have to assume ex an extremely greater importance. What are your views on that? Thank you. Thank you. And sorry, just one, one final question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Amadou Boli from UNU Wider. Uh, quick question to Tony Venable's presentation. Uh, you've mentioned that there is low density in most African cities. So I was just wondering about the causes and also some policy ideas about how to change that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for such a great uh, range of questions. So now we'll close by my asking each of the speakers, and I guess I'll ask them to do it in order that they spoke, uh, to respond to the questions to the extent they can. And, and uh, please excuse us if we don't do so fully, given the constraints of time, and then add any closing comments they would like. Uh, so, Tony. Yeah, let, let me try and just pick up on a few of them. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree completely with the spirit of what 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 Ernest was saying. Yeah, I mean, cities do have to be seen as part of a comprehensive um, development strategy, and cities have to be seen as a whole in themselves. Um, but perhaps the, the the innovation would be to say, I mean, you, you have to see cities as drivers of the industrialization strategy, right? Cities aren't a sort of obstacle to it, a problem. They are where 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 that economic change is going to happen. So yeah, they have certainly see it comprehensively, but with cities playing that key driving role. Um, I didn't talk much at all in the talk about sort of secondary cities and the hierarchy. 
I mean, I think, I think it is going to be very important for Africa to develop secondary cities. I mean, retrofitting existing ones, well, partly the scale of the problem and partly retrofitting existing ones is horribly expensive. So the secondary city thing does need to come up the agenda. Um, the further comment on that is, again, see that as part of the, see these secondary cities as drivers of growth, which basically means put them in sensible places <laughs> where, where, where people want to go and where firms are going to want to go. And clearly there are lots of examples of them, uh, people trying to put them in, in not very sensible places. Um, yeah, on the, on the sort of density livelihood point, yeah, I was talking about as if it was just density to attract footloose manufacturing, but I think absolutely density uh, cuts in at all, all, all those sort of levels. It's not just internationally traded goods or regionally traded goods, it's the locally traded goods, it's the markets, the vibrancy, the service sectors and things. So yeah, really supporting density, vibrancy uh, on, on those levels, uh, I think is, is, is really important. Um, yeah, capital funding. I mean, obviously I argued that there, there's a potential revenue stream from you know, property taxation, whatever. Um, which is important, but there are timing issues on that, so that the need to raise capital. Um, but also a lot of the capital we're talking about, I think, does naturally come from the private sector. I mean, re residential housing. I mean, clearly there's a role for public housing, um, but much more private capital could and should through capital markets and mortgages uh, go, go, go into residential housing. So there's a, the public need, but also yeah, private money can go, can go into the, the residential um, housing stock. And I think that leads into the last point I want, want, want to mention. I mean, the, 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 the causes of low, low density. I mean, a lot of it, if, if you look at the residential side, yeah, there are, I mean, I think on my last slide, I mentioned some of the failures. Yeah, it, I mean, people are not going to invest if property rights are uncertain, um, if building regulations are such that you can't actually afford a house within the regulation, so you have to go outside the regulations, and if you know, capital markets are screwed up, right? So, so there's a <laughs> there, there are a whole load of fairly clear, perhaps difficult to achieve, but fairly clear things that could be done to get more capital going into more substantial construction in the private housing sector. Okay. And denser, therefore. You know, just better quality. Two, two, three, four, five story, not single story shacks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Simon. Okay, let me try and respond as efficiently as I can to, to everything. I've, on the issue of, of livelihoods, I think everything that was said, I, I agree with, and that's, I think, what I was trying to get it and maybe didn't do, didn't do justice to. I think, I think that's exactly what welfare should be there for, is for helping people to find, to find jobs, to, to aid people's livelihoods, to help them to start businesses in the informal sector, to create jobs, all, all of those sorts of things. And, and they should be aimed towards, towards that. Uh, and for, for mitigating the risks of migration and, and helping migrants who are in this vulnerable phase. I mean, at the moment in Addis Ababa, rent subsidies go to long-term residents of the city. You can rent a, rent a room in the center of Addis from the government for 50 cents a month, 50 US cents a month. Um, and a huge number of people who are long-term residents of the city get those subsidies. It's not clear that they're the, they're the people that should be getting those subsidies. They're, they're well established in, in the city. Uh, and so that's, so that's maybe something to think about. Uh, in terms of relocation, that's, yeah, there are, there are tensions there. The, there are people who are able to live in the, sit, the center of the city because of subsidies that, that are allowing them to do that. And we do want to, to make sure that, that people have continued access to their livelihoods in the center. Uh, rents are increasing for a lot of people and they're being forced out of those areas naturally. Uh, and, and, um, and governments at the same time are relocating people forcefully to make way for new infrastructure projects. So these things are happening and, and we need to think about what, what sort of housing responses do, are, are appropriate for that. So yeah, I mean, these are all, all things that I agree with. Uh, and I think will require more research. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not, not sure that I'm answering that perfectly. Uh, 
I think that just to touch on a really kind of big issue, and I acknowledge that this is still kind of hotly debated amongst economists, we had, had this kind of notion of whether we should be discouraging migration or not. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, urbanization without industrialization, or even the idea that an urbanization is too fast in this setting. Um, this is this is still an open topic of, of debate. I tend to think that that, that, that notion is, is wrong, that urbanization is, is happening because people find opportunities in cities, and if you do manage to make them the, the move, you, you're likely to have a good livelihood with a, with a high salary. And we know from a lot of evidence that people are are constrained, more people would like to move, but it's risky. And so I think we should be helping people to move and we should be increasing migration. I don't have an answer to the to how we get industrialization going along with that. In the meantime, people are arriving in cities and finding jobs in the informal sector and the growing private sector. That is happening uh, and aiding that as much as possible is, 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 is important. Uh, so, yeah, last thing, I, th I think we, if, if that urbanization is encouraged, as we've been saying, that needs to come with all this sort of, this sort of in investment. The governments are spending this money. The, the Ethiopian government is spending vast, vast sums on housing projects and welfare and workfare programs. They're, they're finding the finance for it, uh, and it's about deciding on the appropriate policies for, for using that money. Good. Thanks, Simon. Ijaz. Um, just a couple of points. One is that, uh, of course, on the scale at which things need to be delivered for the cities to function, uh, the, the existing revenue base is not going to be enough. And uh, for provincial governments, at least uh, in Pakistan, they cannot do the equivalent of the federal government's deficit financing. Uh, by law, they have to live within the budgets that, that they have. So the only way uh, this current chief minister of Punjab can, can do these massive investments in infrastructure in cities is through public-private partnerships. Uh, that, that green line that I, that I showed you in Lahore, that's public-private partnership. There's an, the orange line that's coming up has a huge Chinese investment in it. Uh, and in fact, the, these, these kinds of arrangements have now been extended to sanitation services as well in the city. So, so I think uh, it, it's, it's only going to be possible by bringing in the private sector in one form or the other and then creating the right environment for the private sector to come in. I completely agree with you. I, I really think that uh, whereas, of course, uh, the government should do whatever it can uh, to support people in their livelihood uh, uh, pursuits when they move to the cities. But, but, but rural urban migration is going to happen regardless of what we do to try to discourage it. Uh, even when agricultural productivity increases, agriculture sheds labor. And, and therefore, people will move. Uh, the question is, what kind of jobs will they move to? Uh, you, they, can, they can always get jobs which are a little bit be, uh, higher paying than, than what they had in the, in the rural areas. But, but, but that's, not, that's not the kind of urbanization that, that we have in mind. I, I, I therefore, I think creating high productivity, especially manufacturing sector job, has to be uh, an integral part of the urbanization strategy, which is why embedding city-level interventions in the larger growth strategy is so important. Um, so I just end there. Good. Thanks, Ijaz. Well, I apologize again for, for running over time. Let me just finish very quickly with a, a, what I think is, is perhaps uh, the, the most relevant one sentence or two sentence summary of what we talked about today. And I think the key message that comes out of uh, the research we've heard today and certainly the research of the IGC as a whole in this area is that cities are drivers of growth and development, not obstacles to growth and development. So yes, there are many challenges, and as, as we've heard today, these are huge challenges, but that we need to be thinking about enabling actions to, to help cities make the transition to become more functional, to become more productive. We know they're important not only in terms of the growth trajectory of countries, but also the welfare of individuals. And I think the point that uh, Simon made, which is so important, is that we know that people who move to cities are better off. So we shouldn't be blocking that process. We should be facilitating that, but also addressing these huge issues that face uh, cities. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for your attention and, and particularly for your patience. <laughs>